Uh, we are going to tackle in a little bit of a of a different style because I figured I'd change the game a little instead of just looking at the the text on my screen here. We're going to tackle the um, <clears throat> the last book in our Wisdom Lit series, and that would be the Song of Songs. Um, when you open up that text, the the title comes from like the first verse of that text that says the Song of Songs that is Solomon's. Or the Song of Songs of Solomon. And um, that gets us into a bit of what the book is called. And that's kind of where we're going to start. So the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's, is, is a pretty good translation of what the Hebrew is doing there. And so um, first thing we, we got to pay attention to is the fact that Song of Songs is a kind of superlative. Like Holy of Holies is a kind of superlative. Um Hebrew doesn't have a most or an EST ending like we do, great est, best, um, or something like that. And so in order to talk about something as the greatest of things, what you do is you compare it to like things. And so if you want to talk about the, the most eloquent or the greatest song there is, you would call it the song of songs. If you want to talk about the most holy place or the holiest thing or the holiest place, you call it the holy of holies. It is amongst holy things, the most holy. It's the set apart thing amongst all other things that are set apart. It's in a class of its own. And so when we talk about this, this book, what we're talking about here is <clears throat> what the author has called the song of all songs. This is the greatest of all songs which could ever be composed and in, is in some way related to or belongs to Solomon. Um, so we're not entirely sure if this is one of those books of Solomon, like Proverbs, like Ecclesiastes, perhaps, or if this is um, of Solomon as in it pertains to Solomon. He's mentioned in the story of the book, uh, but it's a little bit unclear what exactly his role is. And so we're going to kind of walk through that a little bit. So um, when you look at the text of the Song of Solomon, there are two primary characters sort of poetically going back and forth. Um, and the concepts of love, desire, union are ultimately what kind of drive the poetry of the, the storyline that we're looking at here. And it's, it's sometimes a bit of an odd storyline to follow um, because of the poetic nature of the book. But it's effectively um, songs and poetry back and forth between two characters who are in love. And so that, that brings us to some approaches for the book. Um, throughout Christian history, there's been a bit of tension with how we deal with this particular text. And so one of the dominant metaphors, or one of the dominant means of approaching the text of Song of Solomon is uh, this allegory and metaphor. We start with an idea that one of the characters probably, uh, or more, most often, the, the husband figure, the male figure in the story, is God, and the female figure uh, is the people of God. And so this allegory and metaphor, this first approach to the text, has been to kind of spiritualize this and understand that this is God's relationship with Israel. Or in the, in the church era, right after Jesus, it's, it's Jesus and God's Holy Spirit's relationship to the church this personal, intimate, relatedness, interconnectedness, um, and New Testament texts that use the imagery of marriage for Christ and the church <clears throat> help drive that allegorical, that metaphorical interpretation. The problem that, that can be raised with the allegory or the metaphor in the text is that it's, it's not always clear that that's what's intended here. Um, it it sometimes seems more like number two in this approaches to the text, which is that this text is actually just a celebration of marriage and love as God designs it. <clears throat> um, and so in that regard, we might be looking at love poetry or songs celebrating Solomon's marriage to the Shulamite woman, which would appear to be his first marriage. We know Solomon's going to end up having a problem with that later on in his life, but this might be a celebration of that marriage with his first wife, okay? Um, and so in that regard, this text is a celebration of love and marriage as God has intended it, 
and it's uh, extolling God's blessing effectively on the love between a husband and a wife in all of its capacities. And that's where for a lot of uh, church history and for some evangelical Christians today, broadly speaking, evangelical, uh, that celebration of love and marriage and intimacy makes people feel a little bit awkward. Like all of a sudden the scripture is not so PG-13 anymore and this stuff sounds can sound pretty explicit. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of address that as we go. And then the third approach, which is a bit of a combination, but has received some new life in uh, the last probably 10 or 15 years, is looking at Song of Solomon as a wisdom text, ultimately aimed at some of the same things that uh, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Job and the rest of the wisdom literature stuff in our First Testament texts are aimed at. And that is this idea of lady wisdom and the the husband who belongs to to lady wisdom, which which kind of flips the, the Proverbs material on its head. So um, instead of, as Proverbs, the son pursuing Lady Wisdom, sometimes we can take what's going on in the story of Song of Solomon to be Lady Wisdom pursuing the husband or the son from Proverbs. So let's dive into some of the narrative line here and, um, and kind of walk our way through this. So first, the story of the, of the book, when you just kind of look at it on a, on a surface level, is about a woman and her husband or her husband-to-be. Um, at times in the text, they are together, and at times in the text, they are apart. And that is, is probably the biggest overarching thing that, that keeps that the text keeps circling back to in the text. Um, when they are apart, she is looking for him. Whether she's actively searching in the city, or she's looking for him on her couch, or she's just longing for his presence again, she's looking at him riding in on the distance. Um, there's a passage in the text about Solomon returning to the city in all of his glory and splendor, and she's sort of watching him approach. And so the question that that raises is, if this is Solomon and Solomon's wife, then this would be one of Solomon's returns from a trip, from a battle, from a fill-in-the-blank. And she's sort of anxiously awaiting the, the re-arrival of her husband, which um, I think has always kind of been the way that I tend to see the text. Uh, this is Solomon and, and probably his first wife. And in this kind of storyline, there's a bit of multiple layers of things going on here, but that, that passage that speaks to Solomon coming home and all of his regal pomp and circumstance um, always kind of gives me memory of, of coming home to family or coming home to Jessica um, after being gone. And um, turning the corner in the Dayton airport and, and seeing her... Um, dressed in a very beautiful blue dress and waiting for me and just that that reunited like that anticipation and that joy and that celebration of just being in that that moment of being reunited it, that that passage watching Solomon come home sounds a lot like that to me and so what we get is when they are apart this woman she's searching for her husband uh, for her lover as the text calls it and, and she's pursuing after she she misses there's this distraughtness to the fact that she's not with the one her soul loves to quote the book but then when they're together she's just overcome with joy and and the the enraptured nature of being with the one who is your soulmate is it, kind of permeating these reuniting texts as we work through the Song of Solomon. So the pursuit itself, though, becomes sort of the most dominant theme, and um, it becomes the thing that presses you through the book, because as they are apart, whether she's actively searching the city to find this person or is she's searching in her heart or her soul or her mind or her dreams as she's laying on her bed asleep at night, um, this theme of pursuit is what drives the, the dominant storyline of the book. So these two lovers, these, this husband-wife pair, are in search of one another constantly. And when they find each other, um, they are delighted and overjoyed and enraptured with being in the presence of the other. 
the wife figure ultimately though is is the one who's sort of driving this uh, this pursuit language and imagery and we don't really see the husband figure being distraught or missing the same way we see the the wife figure in the story and so she becomes kind of the central focus um, it's her storyline about being with the one she loves or being apart from the one she loves. It's um, her dialogues that drive his responses of how beautiful she is and how wonderful it is to be with her and all of this. Um, she is in pursuit of her husband. It's, it's not an overturning of, of the roles as I think we would typically understand them. Uh, as much as it is the longing to be with the one that she loves. And so she finds herself in this satisfaction. She's at rest. There is peace and joy and um, the wonder of being in love when she is with him. And then when separate, she's distraught and that almost becomes sort of the rationale for why she says, don't arouse or awaken love until it so desires. Because it's almost this, to have it and to be in love with someone, but then to not be able to be present with them is almost more painful than not being in love in the first place. Is, is kind of the paradigm that you pick up from her dialogues in this. The tension with the way that we look at this story as we get to kind of the point and what is going on here is the poetry itself. Um, like I said, for, for most of church history, um, this has been allegor sort of allegorically read, metaphorically understood. However, th especially in recent years, um, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to hide it from it. In recent years, especially in scholarship that sort of discredits uh, the inspiration of the texts and the role of God in the texts and asks more uh, critical questions of what does it mean for the texts to be inspired or doubts those things, uh, calls into question the inspiration, inerrancy, and infallibility of the Bible, um, there, there has been a sort of sexually charged look at the Song of Songs. Um, and so... Even in evangelical Christian scholarship that maintains inspiration, inerrancy, and infallibility of the Bible, um, th there's been an honest question. What is going on here with the poems we get in Song of Solomon? And there, there's a couple of options here. Um, I'm going to use the words from the Bible Project. Song of Songs can be read as, and I quote from the Bible Project guys here, semi-erotic love poetry. Um it, it doesn't fully cross that line of inappropriate, um, but it's not PG either. It, it's, it's an honest statement about the love between a husband and a wife, it seems, or at least it can be seen that way. Um, on the other hand, it, it also fits a lot of these wisdom markers and, and falls into line with a lot of the material that we got out of the book of Proverbs, addresses... Um, core issues that Ecclesiastes has a hard time reconciling because of the lack of God's place in Ecclesiastes. And so there might be multiple things going on with this text. What, what makes it uncomfortable and what makes it a challenge for a lot of Christians today is if this is, at least in some sense, a celebration of marriage and love between husband and wife, does the poetic material in the Song of Solomon's become uh, inappropriate at some point. Um, some of our stories in the biblical texts are just, um, they get real about human sin and they get real about human depravity. And so we see things in Sodom and Gomorrah and we see things in Israel with rape and dismemberments and and whatever, and that's definitely not like PG-13 style material, uh, the Christian recoil at sexualized vocabulary in the scripture is what has made this awkward. 
for uh, for a lot of Christians in history, which is why the tendency is to lean into, well, it's got to be an allegory. It's got to be a metaphor for how Christ and the church and how this. And um, recent scholarship has gone back to saying, well, but what if it's, what if it's not? <laughs> what if it is a, an honest celebration of what marriage is supposed to look like in a, in a godly perspective? And what if it has serious connections to wisdom literature? Does the, the wife figure have this dual role? Yes, this is Solomon's wife. And yes, this is Solomon. And they're enjoying um, what it is to be married. But at the same time, there's this double entendre that moves beyond that sort of physical, spiritual reality in a marriage and into this concept of wisdom. And so if we're going to read this as wisdom literature, then some themes begin to really pull to the surface. First, if we read this as wisdom literature, uh, it seems that the pursuit here in the text of Song of Solomon is the opposite pursuit of what was the son's pursuit of wisdom in the book of Proverbs. So we remember in, in the book of Proverbs, the father advocates to his son consistently, pursue lady wisdom, avoid lady folly, pursue lady wisdom. There's life with her. There's joy with her. There's this enraptured nature to being with lady wisdom. And so that sounds a bit like what the husband and wife figures in the Song of Solomon are describing when they're together. And so one of the wisdom themes here is that it's not just the son in Proverbs who pursues wisdom, but God's wisdom pursues us. And the reason we get this personification as lady wisdom is because the Hebrew word is feminine for wisdom. Like in just about every other language in human history, um, or at least all the ones that I've come across, wisdom is always a feminine noun. <clears throat> and so what we've got then is is wisdom's pursuit, wisdom's longing after human companionship. Um, God wanted wisdom for humanity. God wanted to give wisdom to humanity in his own ways. And when Eve and Adam take from the tree to gain wisdom apart from God, the system is broken and it doesn't operate like it's supposed to. And so this is God's longing. This is wisdom's longing to be reunited to humanity the way that God intended. And so when we read this with wisdom in mind, it, it becomes a little bit more metaphorical, a little bit on the allegorical side, but it's less about Christ and the church. And the image becomes more about lady wisdom, God's wisdom pursuing humanity to restore what humanity's lost in the Genesis 3 fall. And so wisdom then is kind of God's bride prepared for his son, just as the father in Proverbs would want his son to have the best uh, bride that he could possibly find. Uh, God's doing the same thing in Song of Solomon. He's prepared a bride, and that bride is Lady Wisdom. And, and you're you're seeing this play out on two levels. It's Solomon, the wisest of all, with the, the wife of his youth, his first wife, and enjoying their presence together is now being sort of played out on a wisdom level with this is the bride God has prepared for his son. And this pulls back into some of the language out of the Exodus, where in, especially in the dialogue with Moses, as God is telling Moses about the conflict that's going to come up in Egypt, God says to Moses, the, the conflict between me and Pharaoh and, and myself and Israel and, and Egypt with Pharaoh as the head of Egypt is pretty straightforward. This is about me and Pharaoh as father figures and his son and my son. And God identifies in that storyline Israel as his firstborn son. And so this is where the allegory kind of shifts. Um, again, for the bulk of Christian history, uh, the woman in this book is the church or it's Israel and the, the husband figure is, is God. And, and that's a consistent Old Testament image. But another consistent Old Testament image is that the people of God are his children, his son, his firstborn son. That's what, he, that's what he calls Israel in the Exodus event as he's pulling them out of Israel to establish them as the people he wants them to be. And so there's, there's an idea here that what Song of Solomon is playing on is this idea that the son spoken to in Proverbs 
can be seen in Song of Solomon as the husband figure, and God has prepared for that, that son the perfect bride. And the perfect bride for the children of God is God's wisdom, lady wisdom in all of her grandeur and glory. And what is held out to the son and to wisdom when they find each other is that kind of joy and wonder and the gloriousness of all that life can be because we're doing it the way that God wants us to do it. And so that gets us into this, there's life and there's joy and there's wonder and there's this enraptured beauty. All of these Proverbs concepts that come with being satisfied in wisdom and being fulfilled with her and the wife of your youth and all of that kind of thing sort of comes into the imagery here of Song of Solomon. And while this might be on one hand, a bit of a celebration of Solomon's marriage, it might be on the other hand, it might be on the other hand a bit deeper and a kind of play on that human marriage looks like this, but this is what God intends for us who are his people to find wisdom because these things are held out. And so wisdom can be seen here as the beautiful bride, seeking the one she loves. Just like in Proverbs, it's the son who should be seeking out lady wisdom. And so like Proverbs, there's joy for the two when they are together. And when they are apart, what do we see in Proverbs? We see wisdom calling out to those who need her, to those she needs, just like we see the the bride in the Song of Solomon calling out and searching for the one her soul loves and then finding each other and being enraptured in each other's presence and then being separate again. And then the search continues. And it's this back and forth, this sort of seesaw between the search and the finding. Okay, so all of this lands us in a kind of ambiguous place because the text of Song of Solomon seems to be a bit ambiguous. But I think that's part of the point. Um, I think the text is meant to be that way because I think the text is meant to be multivalent. It, it, it's supposed to be layered and layered with meaning um, that, that fits more of our life context than we might originally anticipate. And so first, I, I think there is sort of a, a surface level, if you want to say that, to this text that says um, Solomon's marriage to this wife, uh, presumably his first, is is a celebratory thing. It's a glorious thing. It's a good thing. It's a God-designed thing. This is what God's design for love in marriage looks like when we take delight in what God has given and we take delight in the wife or the husband of our youth, right? And 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 this is what it's supposed to be. This is kind of the the joy of the one your soul loves and 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 com- kind of completes the picture for you, so to speak. Um, on the other hand, one of those other layered meanings might very well seem to be that this is God's design for wisdom with His people or with humanity. Um, I think ultimately God has designed both marriage and wisdom for us and given them to us as these gifts that bring great joy, that bring uh, the life and the, the beauty and the blessing and the sort of we get caught up, the enraptured nature of what Song of Solomon is kind of laying out before us. Um, and so I, I think, for me, reading this text, I think both levels are intended. The kind of more, um, well, I lost my train of thought. Um, I think both levels are intended. The, the wisdom literature intention of lady wisdom pursuing humanity and striving after what God intended for wisdom in human beings. And then on the other side, I, I think that there is a bit of this no, no, it's, it's supposed to be a celebration of love and marriage and um, sort of proper human sexuality and sexual expression in the covenant that God has designed for a husband and a wife. And so 
this is God's intention for his church and his people on multiple levels. Um, and, and ultimately, at the end of the day, I think, I think you can look at the, the text of Song of Solomon and see all three approaches at work somewhere in the text. Um, does God desire a relationship with his people that is intimate and is holy, that is precious, and that is enraptured, like we see the relationship between the beloved and the lover in the Song of Solomon? Absolutely, yes, he does. And that's why that image of, of marriage is used both Old Testament and New Testament for God and Israel and for Christ and the church. At the same time, I think this is God's prepared his bride wisdom to be given in glorious union to humanity. Um, the irony of taking from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the search for wisdom is that that's exactly what we what humanity lost. It's what we lost in trying to get wisdom apart from God. That wisdom has been warped and twisted um, and back to these themes that we've tracked through wisdom literature. It's only God's judgment that gives us that true, holy, glorious, and full of splendor kind of wisdom. And this is God's design for love in marriage and between uh, two people who are both committed to God and to wisdom and to his way of life and committed to one another. And there's a, there's a glory and a holiness and a celebration and a finding of what God intended for our lives to be in all of that. And so I think this, this book, which has the tendency to make so many incredibly uncomfortable and which has led so many uh, teachers and professors and older pastors, um, has led them to, to tell the next generation of church leaders and preachers and teachers to say, just avoid the Song of Solomon um, because we don't know what to make of it or because it's, quote, too sexually charged or fill in the blank. Um, I think the multi-layered meanings in the story and in the poetry of the Song of Songs is exactly the point. Um, I think that sexually charged vocabulary and that tension of, you okay? Like, we've, we've crossed the line of, of PG here, and we've entered some semblance of PG-13 here. Um, I think that's meant to pull our attention in and say, what does God intend for our marriages? I think it's also designed to speak to those who aren't married by saying, what does God intend in the marriage of humanity and wisdom? And then it's supposed to bring us all in on all of those levels, including what does God intend between himself and his bride? God pursues us. We know that. But we are also told to pursue him. And, and it's the wife in in the Song of Solomon, who is in pursuit of the one she loves. And if you look at our lives, especially if, if you're married and you spend any kind of time like this, there are seasons in your marriage where one person is more in pursuit of the other, and then the tides shift. And, and that's part of the, like, the ebb and flow of our relationships. But it's also the way God has designed humanity to be in pursuit of relationship just in general. And so I think we need to look at this text and not discount what might be celebrations of, of physical expressions of love. It, but in marriage, in the context that God designed it, we also need to not get so stuck on that that we miss the point about wisdom and humanity being united. Um, and then we definitely need, need to recognize the role that God ultimately wants this kind of relationship with his people. Um, and so take a new read at the text of Song of Solomon and look at it in some new light with those themes from Proverbs sort of turned around. And instead of looking through the lens of uh, the instruction to the son, go get wisdom, this is now wisdom seeking after that son. Uh, sort of the opposite end of those pursuits. So um, I think... And I hope that that helps with Song of Solomon, um, it, a, a challenging text at times. So thank you guys so much. Uh, I hope 
this was helpful to you. We'll pick up with some new video and some new material in the next uh, couple of weeks. Stay tuned. Um, have a good Friday, and I will talk to you guys soon.